So what I am going to talk to you about is um, writing, writing ancient history as a positional alignment and we enlightenment and we are going to discuss historical novels in uh, Soviet children's literature of the 60s and the 70s, but I also have a little bit bigger um, um, topic to discuss and um, uh, we are going to talk about historical writing. I prepared for you some case analysis, as well as general information about the history of the genre in Russia before it even became uh, Soviet children's literature. Um, I am, uh, in general, the scholar of the 20th century children's literature, the Soviet period of the 1920s, 1930s, the so-called golden age of children's literature. But at the same time, um, my research and this project is part of my long-term research um, on uh, historical genres it is uh, bringing me into different um, time periods in the 60s and the 70s uh, in relationship to this genre were extremely interesting and innovative and um, uh, open new opportunities and new uh, interpretations of the text. Let me start with a an epigraph to my talk today. It is taken from Richard Slotkin, his um, uh, fiction for the purpose of history. At the core of culture is a continuous dialogue between myth and history, plain invention and the core of historical facts. And pretty much I hope to organize my um, presentation to you today along those lines. Um, in 1979, the cultural historian Yakov Gordin, who, was who has contributed much to our understanding of the role of history in the human experience, wrote, We are all subject to the historical nostalgia that comes from a temporal rapture. Only high-level historical prose is capable of psychologically removing the sensation of such a break. Its mission is to restore the connection between times, to create a spiritual, emotional, unified field. For it is only under these conditions that an exchange of spiritual experience takes place." End quote. How applicable would such a comment be to Soviet children's uh, historical prose? Would we be justified in speaking of the creation of a unified emotional field with a young reader whose historical knowledge was formed under the influence of history textbooks the Soviet authorities were constantly rewriting? What then was supposed to become of historical prose, a genre called upon to, um, according to Gordon, uh, restore the connection of time at the time when this connection, that connection was uh, being constantly severe. According to contemporary Russian scholar, late, unfortunately, Boris Dubin, historical prose in Soviet Russia arose, quote, already at the very initial stage of the formation of the new literature. Uh, specifically, it was to sum up the revolutionary takeover and the civil war, end quote. In this Dubin note, the new historical narrative was being created during a period in which Soviet power, quote, was proclaimed a demonstrative ideological break with the past, end quote. He elaborates. Uh, essentially, proclaiming such a break meant one thing. The victorious power and its followers claiming exclusive ownership over the interpretation of social life, both of people's pre-revolutionary history and of the post-revolutionary present, end quote. It was this worldview that shaped the new historical prose for children, wherein the voice of power determined which historical material and historical personalities were suitable for the post-revolutionary generation of readers. Soviet era historical prose for children, like indeed most children's literature of the period, is frequently examined in terms of ideological dogma. 
This approach is entirely understandable as it was precisely historical knowledge that was called upon to incarnate such crucial Soviet postulates as, for instance, patriotism and proletarian internationalism, and to render a Marxist understanding of the formation approach to history, which meant the alternation of economic formation amid class struggle, and thus reduced to a minimum the role of culture and the individual in the given historical process. Still, as I would like to show in this talk, the Soviet uh, era children's historical novel was a contradictory phenomenon. In fact, uh, I intend to demonstrate that it was precisely in this genre that historical knowledge with Gordon saw as necessary to restore temporal connections fulfilled its, however ambiguous, formative role. In my opinion, historical narrative allows us to absorb various trends in children's literature discourse, from blatant propaganda to the no less blatant oppositional fronda, the complex phenomenon that Gordon terms as an act of oppositional enlightenment. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit of a history on how historical novels in Russian children's literature came into being. The historical tale as a standalone genre took shape in Russian children's literature over the course of several centuries. Natalia Zhitomirova, the genre's Soviet researcher, pinpoints three types of historical works for children. The historical biographical, historical everyday, and historical revolutionary. The latter variant took shape mainly during the Soviet period, but the former too emerged in Russia as early as in the late half of the 18th century. Thus, a key contribu contribution to the genre was uh, Vorbereitung zur Weltgeschichte für Kinder by August Ludwig von Schlötzer, a German historian who was a member of the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, Russia, and taught at the boarding school run thereby. By the standards of children's books of the time, this work, prepared by Schlötzer specifically for his pupils, was remarkable. Uh, it used simple language and presented historical events in an engaging manner. Historical sketches also appeared in Nikolai Novikov's Children's Readings of Heart and Mind, 1785-1789. Historical prose aimed at young Russian readers featured translated foreign works, for example, Pierre Blanchard, Plutarch for Young Men, 1809, and Catherine Joseph Adenan Girard de Popillac, uh, Plutarch for Young Ladies, 1816-1820. Thus, the focus of these stories was on extraordinary characters who almost single-handedly made significant changes to history. These books created a specific pantheon of such characters whose lives were worthy of emulation. Predominant in such interpretation of history was not the fact, but personality. The idea of the Plutarch, Plutarch was revived, a term that had been used in Russia for collections of edifying heroic examples from history. A new voice uh, prominent in the development of 19th century historical prose style was Alexandra Yishimova, uh, who undertook the daunting task of retelling Nikolai Karamzin's History of Russian State, 1816-1829, for children. Her own History of Russia in Stories for Children, 1837, opened with the following message to the little readers. Dear children, you like to hear stories of brave heroes and beautiful princesses. You like tales of kind and wicked sorcerers, but wouldn't you like it even more if you could hear not a fairy tale, but a tale of reality that is the honest to goodness truth? Listen then, and I shall tell you about the deeds of your ancestors." End quote. A key advantage of Shimova, and here are the two pictures if you are wondering, I mean, this is Shimova, Shimova is a young Girl, and this is her at the time when she was creating this particular history of Russia in stories for children. 
The key advantage of her history was not so much uh, its adherence to a fact um, as its ability to convey historical material to a child reader. In this way, she followed Schlotzer. Uh, she frequently interrupts her story to address her audience, maintaining an atmosphere of constant dialogue. She asks her reader's opinion and makes references to the knowledge they have already acquired. The emotional force of your narrative and the constant immersion of the reader in the historical process, for example, you can scarcely imagine how happy the inhabitants of Smolensk were to rejoin their ancient fatherland, end quote. It lends a tone of authenticity to the historical past and, at the same time, encourages one to trust the narrator. Through Ishimova's artful storytelling, History does not just come alive in pictures of the past, but becomes an integral part of the present. Interestingly, although regime of a treatment includes both the everyday and biographical variant of the genre, both forms of historical narrative she employs are based in actuality. What she relates is first and foremost a historical fact enriched with details from everyday life and from the lives of particular individuals. From the very beginning of its existence, the 19th century children's historical tale was developing as an utterly free, even eclectic genre combining historical with biographical narrative, historical tale with the narrative of everyday life, and history was adventure narrative. We see mutations of this sort, not only in, um, in the early years of the genre, but also in the works that appeared later. This eclecticism will paradoxically survive and be preserved in the Soviet period. It enabled the merger of two key aspects of historical narrative identified by the German scholar Gabriela von Glasenab as Historia, that which is narrated in fictional form, and Geschichte, a particular historical event most frequently perceived in the historical narrative as a decorative background. As von Glasenab describes, authors of historical tales may preserve the specificity of a historical event, Geschichte, while allowing themselves considerable latitude in the inventing characters, dramatis persona of the historia, who serve to disseminate historical knowledge even as the true historical characters are locked within specific historical bounds. Skillfully combining historical knowledge and didacticism, children were to take the cue from great persons, with an entertaining adventure element. Russian historical prose for the young became one of children's literature's favorite genres. At different periods in Russian development, interest in national history competed with the demand for works on world history, but both were quite broadly represented in children's reading matter. The primacy of works about Russian history was always a considerable part of children's experience with history as a concept, in particular, as the Russia's 18th century scholar Mikhail Lomonosov put it, Russian history was to teach the young how to take pride in, quote, the glorious name of the Russian people. When it came to antiquity as a part of world history, the situation was somewhat more complex. Beginning with the first Russian gymnasia, this is secondary school, um, of the 18th century, such as Pastor Johann Ernst Glück's Moscow School, 1702-1708, the knowledge of ancient languages was a requirement for academic success and career advancement. Their students studied ancient history through Greek and Latin letters, um, lessons, excuse me, mostly when reading text in the original. Um, uh, broadly promoted during the reign of Alexander the First, here he is. Um, the knowledge of Greek, however, was substantially reduced when Nicholas I uh, assumed the throne. According to his contemporaries' reminiscences, the Decemberist Revolt uh, of 1825 and the Revolution of 1848 instilled in Nicholas 
uh, the first quote in antipathy to the Greek, end quote. I mean, I know the Greek scholars are present. I apologize for the czar who definitely didn't appreciate it. Uh, he believed that ideas of the republic as a form of governance spread through that language. Therefore, ancient history was removed from secondary school curricula in 1848 to eliminate any discussion as to the advantage of a republic over a monarchy. A model classical education was renounced immediately after the October Revolution. One of the first Bolshevik decrees um, of 18, uh, 1918 established Yedini United Labor Schools, in which instruction was to focus on information about productive work, with historical knowledge centers first and foremost on the history of labor, the prism through which the history of society was to be conceptualized generally. Classical languages were brushed aside as dead knowledge. Speaking at the Third Congress of Komsomol Young Communist Organization in 1920, Vladimir Lenin insisted on purifying education of the unnecessary dead knowledge. Thus, the post-revolutionary development of children's historical prose called for the new rules and new priorities. Children's literature dependency on the country's political situation was a rapidly forming political correctness um, that led to the creation of a particular meta text of the historical tale for the young. Now it had to include the following mandatory components class struggle, portrayed as the engine of historical progress, emphasis on the leading role of the popular masses an elevated revolutionary pathos served, serving as a key emotional mode, and what is most important, the framing of the historical space by means of us and them by narrative. Thus, during the 1930s and 1940s, the delicate balance between Historia and Geschichte was violated. The Stalinist purges of the late 1930s presented Soviet children, uh, Soviet children's writers, with a difficult task of reflecting and constantly re-evaluating revolutionary history, where I, uh, yesterday's heroes kept turning into today's enemies of the people. Uh, my parents used to tell me how their school day would start with uh, the teacher requiring them to take pencils, color pencils, and color over the portraits of revolutionary leaders who were the day before uh, no longer, according to Stalin's government, celebrated heroes, but rather new spies and criminals accused of treason. As the prominent scholar of Soviet censorship, Arlene Bloom remarks, quote, the circle of children's reading was subjected to perhaps the most radical defamation of all. In its Soviet context, the children's historical narrative was subjected not only to the ideological pressure of the censorship, but also to that of the author's own self-censoring. The state's constant rewriting of history ultimately led to one's loss of political bearings. The desire to invent historia uh, then was most often dictated by the politics of the moment and not just by the author's wish to select historical events and arrange them into a narrative according to the chosen order. In other words, the discrimination with the particular movements of history was rarely the result of an authorial decision. Rather, it was dictated by the set of events and a roster of heroes determined by the party's interpretation of grand history. Moreover, the closer history in question was to the contemporary moment, the more difficult it was for a children's author to write about it. But let us return to the subject of our conversation today, ancient history in children's fiction. I would like to turn to several key studies that I have prepared for you today. Again, I would go to one of my favorite authors for today, um, Richard Slotkin, and the quote from his fiction for the purpose of history. History is what it is. 
but it is also what we make of it. What we call history is not a thing, an object of study, but a story we choose to tell about things. Contemporary Russian scholar um, uh, Irina Arzamasova notes that under the Soviet regime, the classical world fared rather better in literature than Christianity did, which is totally understandable from the historical development. Here is a quote. Of course, the whole strata bearing the stamp of reactionary names were uh, consigned to oblivion. But thanks to certain old school intellectuals who took part in the creation of socialist culture, the idea of Russian antiquity were carried over, albeit with some losses, to the generations born after the October Revolution. A Roman stratum of literature quickly accumulated in children's publications of the 1920s and 1930s, as well as in fiction and educational works and textbooks. All manner of knowledge of Rome was passed on to Soviet children. And in this, the free Hellas remains in the shadow of imperial Rome, end quote. This assertion is indisputable. Here one could speculate that it is actually, uh, that it's, excuse me, actuality had to do with the controversies of Soviet imperial consciousness. But to me, it seems that the issue is far simpler. Rome and Roman history were in demand in Soviet Russia because of the existence of a universally accepted meta text, a history of Spartacus uprising, albeit not at all in its Italian version, apologize to my Italian colleagues. Soviet critics, and especially those specializing in children's literature, rejected Raffaello Giovannioli, uh, novel Spartacus, which in their view took, quote, the sole hero in Roman history that could be truly close to our hearts and reduce him to the status of passionate lover, end quote. In 1933, as a sort of do-over of the theme, Vasily Yan produced a historical tale, Spartak. This is the one. Uh, that was for children and young adults. This new composition opened with a quote from Lenin. The leader of the Bolshevik revolution inscribed the impact of the uprising on the destruction of the slave system. The introduction not only validated Jan's choice of historical subject matter, but also suggested that his plot written from scratch fitted in perfectly with the Soviet historiography's approach to historical fiction as a formational reading matter. Well, um, here is uh, Giovannioli's text, I mean, that was actually translated as early as 1908 in Russia. So, and I couldn't help myself, but here I have Kirk Douglas as a Spartacus, so I apologize, but this is my personal preference, so that you have to suffer through. So, um, uh, let us turn to the 1960s, the time that brought a significant change into the Soviet literature in general and children's literature in particular. The liberalization that commenced in Soviet Russia the year of Stalin's death is referred to as the Daw, T-H-A-W, uh, or in Russian, Otsipi, in particular due to the novel of that title by Ilya Edinburgh, 1954, which embraced the artist's right to self-expression, uh, criticized events of immediate history, uh, purges of 1937, and expressed hope for change. Often recognized as a hero of the early thought was the Soviet-era writer and critic Vladimir Pomerantsev in groundbreaking statements made in his article on sincerity in literature published in uh, Novimir, December 1954, Pomerantsev insisted on sincerity as the criterion of literary artistic achievement. His claim that the writer should follow personal creative impulses rather than official party doctrine was truly innovative and brave. Signaling liberalization at the state level was Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th Party Congress on 25th February 1956. 
Here, the Soviet leader denounced Stalin's cult of personality and blamed him for, for the destruction of many innocent lives during the purges. The literature of the Tsar led to the destruction of myths of the revolution. It was in this very brief period that the new liberal requirements of literature were formulated. Uh, what were they? Sincerity in the depiction of reality, value of individuality in the representation of characters, and this is very important for what we are going to discuss later. Rejection of monumentalism in favor of a deep interest in emotional side of human experience. Again, another postulate that became incredibly important for the new generation of uh, history, history writers. The unleashing of the artistic power of imagination. Here we have our Historia. New in literature was the turn to the history of everyday life, to the problems of an individual, not necessarily a heroic person. Thus, Homo ordinarius, an ordinary person, became the object of new historical prose. If the history textbooks gave only a superficial connection to historical events, then the children's historical prose took on the task of showing the involvement of an ordinary person with history, how his connection with time, and the reflection of time in how his single life. The hero of children's historical prose was not a king, not a strong personality worthy of emulation, but a simple person who lived and, most important, survived in history. Um, common to the most varied authors working in the genre was their aspiration to enlighten as a prerequisite for education in their understanding of the role of enlightenment as the transmission of knowledge. This advent of ancient history and children's literature may to some extent be associated with an observation by Shimon Markish, a philologist and scholar of antiquity, regarding the unparalleled atmosphere of the ancient classics that reigned in the hearts and minds during the most stagnant period of Soviet history. Quote, when people absorb the words, phrases, ideas, and images of the ancients, drink them in as an antidote to Soviet savagery and boorishness, imbibe civilization as an alternative to barbarism." End quote. One of the most frequent employments, employment, employed tools to such enlightenment became historical commentary. Historical commentary Historical commentary, which by children's book structure, and especially because of the educational function of children's literature, was supposed to perform, was an indispensable part of historical narratives for the young. It also became an important method of disseminating knowledge that released historical text from its ideological captivity. An exemplary footnote began to fulfill an educational function in the children's historical tale. Among the books that rely uh, on footnotes to enlighten young readers was The Adventure of a Boy and His Dog, 1959, by Nadezhda Skaminska and Natalia Bramley, both of whom had previously taught history in school. To supplement their knowledge, they recruited a Hermitage Museum expert in Roman history, Maria Sergeyenka. The narrative centers on Cleo, a Sicilian boy captured with his dog Leo by pirates and sold into slavery. Included here is the requisite description of the boy's suffering as he becomes a play toy for the um, patrician spoiled son. But this politically correct twist does not preclude the works turning into a sort of short course on everyday life in ancient Rome. Violating the ideological parameters of the metatext, the authors focus on historical knowledge not directly related to the binarity of the oppressor and the oppressed. They present the information in footnotes, which formed, to use Gerard Ginetti's term, a paratex. Here, the one full of ordinary Roman realias like 
atrium, lararium, toga, bula, senate, pantheon, assemblies, as well as of the complex relationship between patricians and the clients. Astaminsky and Bramley present all this everydayness as ancient Roman life as clearly connected to the events taking place in the life of their main characters. The apartex becomes a background for Cleo's adventure journey, but it is in no way hinders uh, the unfolding of the narrative. Indeed, Cleo's story is constructed as a travelogue. He is always moving about the ancient Roman territory. The reader follows him first to the slave market, then to the Latifundia, then to the urban villas of Roman patricians. Together they visit the Circus Marcus, the Forum, and the Coliseum. The reader even accompanies Cleo to the camp of, surprise, surprise, Spartacus. So there could be no ideological complaint regarding um, uh, regarding the boy and his dog's adventures. Surprisingly, however, Spartacus does not let the young hero stay in his camp, sending him instead back home to his family. Thus, Cleo doesn't become a young adventurer, an ancient Roman analog of the pioneer hero. What's more, the clairvoyant Spartacus tells the young would-be follower that his cause is doomed. Moreover, he said that Cleo must live as he is still very young. What is more, the authors completely violate the heroic principle of Soviet children's literature when they explain that many slaves were dissatisfied with the severe discipline Spartacus enforced in his army. Some of them had signed on for the sake of bloody vengeance for which their leader had no appetite, while others came in search of easy plunder and were thus looting not just noble uh, manners, but the property of poor peasants as well. Such coverage of Spartacus uprising clearly contradicts every postulate of the historical dialectic that the Soviet educational system aimed to establish. Even so, this tale did become required extracurricular reading, <clears throat> excuse me, and was very popular, not just among school children, but among history teachers as well. In the late 1950s, 1960s, Soviet readers discovered ancient history as opposed to classical antiquity, the history long preceding Spartacus. Not only tales of the ancient world now appeared in children's literature, but they were also incorporated in the widely circulated volumes for extracurricular reading. Among the new authors of historical fiction of this kind was the Egyptologist Melissa Mathieu. In 1954, she has produced her first novel for children, An Egyptian Boy's Day, 1954, which was followed by Curry, uh, the Artist Apprentice, 1963. And while she, like many other authors, all tended to preserve the Marxist postulates in her works, in her tales, class struggle remained the driving force of historical development. She seasoned this politicized scheme with adventures of her child protagonist, fascinating enough for the standoff between the oppressor and oppressed to take a back seat. The living and breezing hero of history, typically a coeval of the young reader, came to the fore of her narratives, which now centers on the character's everyday life, on historical events affecting them, and most important of all, on the historical meaning of their actions. It was the semantic shift that ushered in a new kind of historical thinking, gradually liberating, liberated from ideology. Professional historian Mathieu um, uh, infused historical fiction with a sense of the world's multidimensionality, thereby breaking down the ideological binarity predominant in Soviet children's literature. Most crucially, her characters replaced a pioneer hero with a peer hero, a boy or a girl whose tale was not only and not so much of a class struggle, but of the fascinating world of the past, accessible only through knowledge. Mathieu combines two key functions of historical prose for children. The book aims to saturate readers with appropriate information, but it also contributes to their moral education. 
The narrative is full of colorful details related to just one day in the life of the Egyptian boy Satu. The author describes his parents' house um, as well as his school uh, with its kindly teacher Amenhotep and its mean-spirited instructor Shad Su, who is quick to strictly punish his pupils. The dense informational layer of Matthias Geschichte, rich in historical knowledge, is constantly diluted by Historia, the particulars of the fictional world in which Satu and his friend Inu live. Thus, even as the function of moral education in an Egyptian boy's day remain, remains ideologically programmed, um, predicated on the um, inevitable portrayal of class struggle, the story of everyday life, even more specifically the story of the objects surrounding the boy, becomes more important and interesting. Nevertheless, upsetting the balance between historical evidence and adventure is the usual ideological binarity. Matthieu's documentation of the conflict between the oppressor and the oppressed. Thus, while wandering around the city, the well-off Satu becomes acquainted with the life of poor people, and it is these encounters that cause him to see anew the world of the ancient city and ponder the need to change this reality. Eventually, Satu goes from being a reader's guide through history's labyrinths to potentially becoming a revolutionary. But the pressure of the socialist realist canon eases up at the end of the tale. For Mathieu, uh, turning from the purely informational component of her storytelling to the historical narrative, devotes her full attention to fairy tales and stories of ancient Egypt which Setu and his friends diligently copy in hieroglyphics on clay tablets during school lessons. Uh, Mathieu herself, she was the curator of the Egyptian exhibition at the Hermitage. But if in this first tale, Mathieu was able to at least reduce the pressure of the matter canon concerning predominantly on, um, oh, excuse me, concentrating predominantly on Historia. In her second, most interesting tale, Kari, the artist's apprentice, she got so carried away by the informational side of Geschichte that she almost abandoned the ideologically correct model of history predicted on revolt against injustice and exploiters behind it. While also present in Kari, the um, artist's apprentice, the political agenda merely influences the historia's development. Unlike Satu, Kari is a simple boy from a village of coal heaters, the term used in ancient Egypt for servants, including workers engaged in the construction of royal tombs. Um, everyone in Kari's family is employed in this industry, and the boy's whole life proves uh, subject to class struggle between the poor and honest people of the village and the corrupt city elite. In accordance with the state-endorsed requirements for a heavily ideolo uh, ideologized narrative model, the adventure plot concerns three different boys from Thebes, turns into a story of the unmasking of dishonest and two-faced aristocrats against whom the artist heavy turns uh, the teacher and patron to whom the talented Kari is apprenticed uh, raises the rebellion of coal heaters. Here is the artist. Like Spartacus in his Soviet rendition, Heavy seeks to gain uh, nothing for himself. His goal is to aid the disadvantaged. He is um, unselfish, noble, and honest. His ideology and leadership is above reproach, and he has no fear of the power whom he must still serve with his art. Thus, does the brave Havi refuse to ornament the pharaoh's tomb until the innocently condemned are set free? Still, this leader of the disadvantaged lingers outside the revolutionary rostra of um, uh, usual personalities. Soviet uh, in that Soviet readers were accustomed to. By the standards of Matthias contemporaries, Heavy, the painter, is an intellectual, an artist. 
And he fights for the rights of the downtrodders, not with a weapon in hand, but through his creativity, which he refuses to subjugate to the dictates of those in power. It may still be true, though, that aimed, uh, that amid the gallery of heroes of children's historical literature, Havi is an ancient equivalent, Egyptian equivalent of Spartacus. But his leadership example is adjusted by the culture of the 1960s. The book came out right after the Cuban Missile Crisis and followed the appearance in print of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich in Novy Mir in November 1962. This was the frightful time in the life of Soviet intellectuals and artists. Although greatly relieved by Stalin's death in 1953, in December 1962, they saw Khrushchev's famous attack on the works of abstract art at the Maniere, which shattered everyone's illusion about the possibility of an alliance between the authorities and the intelligentsia. To this context, Matthias' choice of a member of intelligentsia vested with privileges and yet able to maintain his sense of social, social justice for a hero of a children's book was fairly unusual, especially as her heavy is not alone in resisting the, the social evil. In the tale, he's joined by the Bekamut, a doctor willing to treat Kari's paralyzed sister free of charge and serve as a surrogate father to the lonely old by rich grandson of a high priest of Amun Ra's the temple. Uh, Bekamut uh, hides Kari when the latter seeks escape from pursuers who have bitten him. Interestingly, in such instance, Matthias' fiction historia controls the events of grand history, that is, who um, invented characters changed the course of history according to the laws of justice. Of particular importance in this regard is the episode in which Amun-Ra, the main god of Egypt, presides over a fair trial during the year's main holiday, the Festival of the Valley. Machia unfolds all stages of preparation for the holiday before her readers, describing in detail, for instance, the selection of flowers and waving of garlands with which officials would deck their homes. She also depicts the masks of God considering to be part of the procession and knows their places in the complex system of the ancient Egyptian religion. Masterfully, with such enthusiasm that uh, there would be hardly seem to be room for any revolutionary sub subtext. She guides her readers through a dense layer of historical knowledge, recreating the minutest aspects of the procession. Then, as even suddenly catching herself, Mathieu rather abruptly redirects her story toward anti-religious propaganda. The festival's fair trial her narrator explains, is carried out not by the chief god of the Egyptian pantheon Ra, but by the high priests themselves. They have beforehand decided upon the verdicts. One of the unjustly accused turns out to be um, Curry's father. You see it here, uh, the carpet, the carpenter. Excuse me, the carpenter Anahu. His boss, Panab, a man in charge of pyramid construction, had been trying to get him steal the gold meant for a sarcophagus. Onahu is saved by Kari's friend, Rames. Rames hides inside the god's statue over here. So, um, and following the priest's secret sign, pulls a strap guiding the hand of God toward either the pottery shard that indicates the defendant's condemnation or the one stating that he should go free. Risking his life, Rames refuses to pronounce his friend's father guilty and instead has the God touch the shard of acquittal. Justice triumphs, but it comes not from a deity, but from a faithful friend. And yet, 
even amid such politically useful aspects of narrated history. It is the informational material not corresponding to present ideology that provides far more solid. The coal heaters collectively revolt against injustice and thereby triumph. The high priests who had overseen the whole life of ancient Thebes quickly give up their positions and the thieving boss Panop is replaced with a new construction chief. What seems more important for the tale's young readers, though, is not as much the wholly fictitious revolutionary situation foist on the plot from without by the socialist realist canon, but rather the ancient story of three boys, Kari, Ramas, who dreams of becoming a doctor and treating the poor, and Chitu, the son of the city's chief landscaper. Historia and Geschichte seem to balance each other out relegating revolutionary propaganda to the back burner. And my conclusion. The works of children's historical prose analyzed in my talk show how complex and contradictory was the rise and development of this genre in Soviet children's literature. How frequently the delicate balance between Geschichte and Historia was upset. It is possible that the historical tale for children preserved the pre-revolutionary edifactory tradition like perhaps no other genre in Soviet children's literature. Broadering the reader's world view through immediate contact with history as well as through the facts and dates packed into an exciting journey uh, to the world of the past would also remain a primary goal of the Soviet children's writer historians uh, education through words. The definition invented by Samuel Marshak, a premier children's writer and one of the founders of the Soviet era children's literature. Of course, children's uh, works on revolutionary history, along with the historical biographical propaganda text on Lenin and other leaders of the workers' movement, constitute their own block of required school age reading. Yet, Another section of children's literature, standing as I have tried to demonstrate somewhat apart, was the historical prose that told of ancient history and classical antiquity. The professionals involved in children's historical prose were scholars and historians, individuals with knowledge of Geschichte. Facing them was the complex task of conveying their experience in the climate of constantly shifting historical authorities of the varying interpretation of historical events filtered through the prism of Marxism. Fortunately for their readers, Historia came to the rescue. A fictional hero at the center of the narrative became one sky through the historical reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina, for this thought-provoking presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question by uh, Silvia Kamiskamacho from, yeah. <laughs> from the Institute of Slavic Studies. Uh, are any of the books you examine in today's lecture part of the current Russian school curriculum? Would you say that they may be of interest to contemporary Russian readers? Ancient history is usually popular with young readers. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, they are, and they are reprinted, both of those, I mean, all three of those books, um, uh, by contemporary uh, publishing houses, uh, but they still, all three, belong to what we call extracurricular reading. I mean, they are not part of, uh, um, like, uh, required reading for school children. But this is pretty much, this is pretty much common in, um, even post-Soviet educational uh, educational era. So when you have this um, recommended, this list of recommended literature. Mm -hmm. The one mm -hmm. thing that I also wanted to say that the reprinting of those books, um, uh, you know, is given to what I would call elite publishing houses for children, uh, such as uh, Samakat, for example, you know, uh, uh, they are reprinted in the most beautiful way, but they are pretty expensive. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, okay, uh, Yulia uh, Gush has raised her hand. So, uh, Yulia, please go ahead with your question. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. It was very interesting. Thank and you. The second yeah. of which, um, I have more so uh, two questions. One which is very similar to the first one. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any books in Soviet literature you would recommend for a reader such as me that would like to uh, actually see how the development went? And secondary, if there are any ones uh, for children that have a little bit darker themes, because it is actually my uh, passion to finding out how the fairy tales and how the children literature looked at the very beginning of their creation, because as we all know, uh, during the evolution of um, literature for children, we have the step from pretty dark themes, even in 20th century, Peter Pan went pretty graphic with some of its descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering just how it was in Russian literature, because I am well aware about things like Maya Debi, well, generally German literature, mm. uh, grim fairy tales. And uh, I wonder how it went with Soviet literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do we have another 40 minutes? Uh, so, uh, let us start with fairy tales. I'm sort of picking up where you left, okay? Um, so, uh, where you started, excuse me. And thank you so much for your question. So, uh, Afanasyev collection of fairy tales uh, underwent the same, absolutely the same purification as Grimm's. So, all the fairy tales that had grim endings or sexual undertone, uh, they were removed from um, the reading list for children and the, the, the sort of um, censored uh, collection appeared uh, in the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, you know, and sort of was re printed even during the Soviet time. And then folklore had a very complicated history in uh, Soviet Russia. Um, as a shameless advertisement, I would refer to my own work on it. So it, the volume is called Politicizing Magic. Uh, and I have the whole part on Soviet socialist fairy tale in it. So, um, and to be honest with you, it was interesting because uh, the purified Afanasy version uh, versus the um, Soviet version uh, of fairy tales created uh, under socialist realism, one of them uh, is by the most popular writer of the Soviet era, Arkady Gaidar. Mm -hmm. So his fairy tale on my Chishki Balchish and his firm word ends ends with the death of the main hero. But his death is celebrated. It was sort of the preparation to the literature about pioneer heroes, for which a good friend of mine and an excellent scholar, Svetlana Maslinska, is, um, uh, has written widely, and this is probably, she is the most um, knowledgeable person about that. So, but this is it. So horror was not horror, um, reduced variant, was not part of the folklore tradition that was passed to um, the, the Soviet generation and even post-Soviet generation. But uh, there were different tales that were created uh, under socialist realism that had all those grave elements that were um, that the new audience, the new readers were familiar with. Death and deprivation and um, sacrificing life was part of uh, Soviet literature discourse, but it was always death in the name of the brighter future. Mm -hmm that was sacrificed in the name of larger masses. That what was, was accepted and celebrated. However, um, Arkady Gaidar is a very controversial writer and, and um, I would not just put him into this block of Soviet authors mm -hmm. and, and forget him there, so not needed, not interesting anymore. Just the opposite, I mean. If you would like to read, he has a story that is called, it's a little novella that is called The Fate of a Drummer. It's probably the most interesting text you can find today. I'm not exaggerating. So, um, your second question about um, was about Soviet books that are still of interest. Yes, there are a lot of Soviet books that are still of interest because Soviet children's literature was a very interesting phenomenon. Um, 
there are two positions that uh, scholars um, take on this history of Soviet children's literature. Uh, one is it was all ideology, forget about it, throw it away. Uh, and this is predominantly in the West. Um, uh, the uh, other point of view is, oh, the children's literature was so great, uh, it was less censorship in children's literature than it was in literature for adults. Therefore, it was refuge. It was hiding place. Uh, this is the point of view that um, many of contemporary Russian critics and historians of children's literature represent. Uh, in my opinion, and I have written about it a lot, uh, it is neither, no. It was literature. It has its own um, problems. Uh, it has its own rules that were very carefully crafted and the children's authors were very much punished. Probably if you consider the amount of writers for adults and the amount of uh, writers for children who were um, killed, exiled during the purges, you know, I mean, children's literature would be definitely a champion. So it was literature with its own problems and its own status and its own achievements and failures. One of the greatest achievements was not because it was a freer space, but because uh, it attracted very interesting authors. Think about it. The throwaway literature of the previous centuries. They started anew. How many writers have a chance to say, my God, I was at the beginnings of the literature that was created? The 20s and the 30s are extremely important. I mean, the time that I prefer <laughs> to talk about. So, I mean, they were extremely the golden time of children's literature. Literature. They were in Soviet Russia. They were extremely important. If you would like to go back to this particular literature, read the Abiru. This is like absurdist poetry. Daniel Harms and his group. With, um, uh, so, uh, and those poems are still very popular. Uh, Mayakovsky poems for children. I mean, this is such an innovative style of poetry, and this is such an innovative dialogue with the children's audience. So they are still very uh, well known to, uh, to the... Um, uh, to people who work with children's literature, to the specialists, as well as to the readers. And um, as for um, the latest stuff, so right now I'm involved in the project together with a couple of my colleagues, you know, who are present here today, um, uh, on um, Holocaust literature. This is a very new uh, work for me because I have never worked with Holocaust literature, especially for children. And surprise, surprise, there are no Russian authors who write about Holocaust. All literature that exists for children about Holocaust is translated. Uh, if you would like me to recommend your works of children's literature that you would enjoy reading, please write to me. I will be happy to send you a list of my references. Yeah, but to begin with, you can start with a fairy tale that I was reading yesterday for myself, just for fun. It is called Three Fat Men. Politically incorrect, I know, but still, Three Fat Men by Yuri Alesha. O-L-E-S-H-O. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some more questions. Uh, oh, yeah. I was about to also say thank you for explaining. And uh, I will gladly text you later on about the books. <laughs> yeah, please. Please. I will be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you once yeah. again. Mm -hmm. And thank you for a great question. Thank you for a great question. And yeah. Marina, thank you for, for your wonderful yeah. answer. It was yeah. like yeah <laughs> a longer answer than i anticipated myself so but you got me into my area so I, <laughs> i'm happy <laughs> there's one question which is uh, directly connected to to what you have already said um about folklore and folk tales mm -hmm. uh, so can you say something more about uh, the influence of folklore folk tales in the children's literature of the soviet era either in form of symbols uh, motifs or anything else 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll be happy to. So folklore and fairy tales had a very, very, very complicated history in, in Soviet children's literature. So first of all, it was prolet cult, I mean, proletarian culture association that denounced this literature. I mean, fairy tales are, were not for the Soviet children because they glorify uh, princes and princesses and uh, uh, becoming rich, so ideologically bad, so let us throw it away. And uh, the 20s, the late 20s, uh, and the beginning of the 30s were terrible uh, toward folklore uh, and fairy tale genre in general. There were things like, let us take the fairy tale to the court and let us... um, um, uh, destroy all those sickly fantasies. I mean, we don't need them. Even the new fairy tales, like for example, um, uh, Karnichikovsky, his fairy tales in verse. Again, I mean, bourgeois nursery. Nadezhda Krupskaya, Lenin's widow. Actually, you know, I'm thinking about it. There were so many widows of party leaders who participated in all the discussions of children's literature. They never taught school. They, well, barely had children, I mean, and why did they become specialists in children's literature? I don't know. But anyway, that was the story. So, and Krupska published uh, an article in um, Pravda, the leading newspaper, uh, accusing Tchaikovsky of writing what she calls in Russian bourgeoisie mood. So bourgeois nonsense and bourgeois nursery. This is where we put the fairy tales. So, and of course, you know, I mean, such an important character and she was not only Lenin's widow, she was also in charge of censorship and she was in charge of political education. So, I mean, they stopped publishing fairy tales, they stopped publishing uh, Karni Chukovsky. So, um, as one of the examples of contemporary fairy tales. And even more, um, Krupska was in charge of uh, library science in Soviet Russia, so the fairy tales were excluded. Luis Afanasi excluded from the collections of libraries. But you know, in Russia, it's a great tradition because library, uh, an official institution, this is great, this is wonderful, but you also have a collection of books at home. So, yeah, and uh, Krupska couldn't go that far. So, and Russian children, Soviet era children were exchanging uh, those fairy tales and they were still fairy tales were still sort of I would say underground reading. So uh, it changed in 1934 uh, when Gorky, Maxim Gorky, the leading Russian uh, proletarian uh, author, um, gave his talk at the first um, first Congress of the Union of Soviet Writers and he started it with the fairy tale is great. This is the soul of simple people, and Ivan the Fool and Vasilisa the Beautiful, they are great characters, so, and from there on, fairy tale, like, by command, fairy tale became, um, became um, a required genre. And now, uh, the story started to develop in a different realm, so the Soviet writers started to write fairy tales. And the fairy tales that I would um, mention here, this is Yulia Alesha, The Three Fat Men, uh, possibility to explain the revolution through the fairy tale, fairy tale um, um, modus operandi. Uh, it was um, it was Arkady Gaidar, who I have mentioned before, and his fairy tale about my Chishki Bajish and his firm work became uh, very important in uh, Soviet children's literature discourse. Then it was uh, Kaverin who was <clears throat> writing, excuse me, writing about like moral aspects of upbringing of Soviet citizens, so sharing aspects. So, and uh, his fairy tale, Flowers and the Seven Petals, became also very important. And um, in the later time, um, when I would say the 50s, the 60s, the translation, translated fairy tales uh, started to have uh, more value in Russian um, fairy tale culture. Uh, very famous, as always, was the image of Baba Yaga. So uh, this... Um, transitional character because she always, she can be a great 
helper if I'm using uh, if I'm using um, a fairy tale character's definition. So she can be a helper, she, she can also be an enemy. So she can destroy the character, help the character. And Baba Yaga became a favorite character of new tales. But we also new tales, new uh, post, uh, post sorry, new post uh, war tales. This is the culture of the fifties and the sixties, and even in the seventies, I would say. And the new fairy tales became created, and um, we also cannot forget certain fairy tales that use examples of other literatures. Like, for example, we have with you all of you have read. Pinocchio by Kalori, right? In Russia, Pinocchio was translated before the revolution, but it was not so, it didn't have the reputation in parentheses. Uh, so because Russia has its own variant, it was Buratino. It was the character with a long nose, Pinocchio, if you remember. So he grows nose when he lies. Boratina is born with a long nose, which sort of hints on the author, Alexei Tolstoy, who created a controversial character, the character who uh, was a liar from the very beginning. <laughs> so the folklore elements, the structure of a tale would be employed by various Soviet era writers. Uh, the fairy tales were filled with new uh, content that would speak more to the new generation. Another very famous fairy tale, for example, is the old genie Khatabich. And uh, the story is about a Soviet pioneer finding a bottle in inside this bottle a vessel so inside this vessel was the genie whom he liberated and the genie supposed to serve aladdin aladdin in disney's uh interpretation so but this genie needed to be proved to be wrong because no soviet citizen needs magic for help because this is self-reliance so Fairy tale characters are still alive. They are still used in uh, cartoons, for example, animation. Uh, this is a series of animation right now. It is called um, Chest of Treasure uh, that comes back to folk tales. And uh, those animations um, introduce uh, the post-Soviet audience to official, uh, to, excuse me, to traditional characters, folklore characters. So fairy tales are republished with new illustrations, but like I said, the influx of uh, foreign tales, like Pippi the Longstrom, uh, who else, um, Pinocchio now, you know, and this uh, Kalodi uh, original interpretation. So uh, Carlson, for example, I mean, we have, mm -hmm. who lives on the roof, so we have, um, uh, those characters who came into being through either animation or translations. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, in this sort of mingle with traditional characters like Baba Yuga, for example, or Kashi the Dazzlers. What is very interesting, you know, this live journal um, opportunity, people write fairy tales, they write themselves into this traditional fairy tales and they create an incredible variety of situations for the traditional folklore characters. But that's a different story. I don't want to talk about that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this great answer. We have one more question. Mm -hmm. Is ancient history a popular focus in contemporary Russian text for young readers? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, it is. And um, uh, like I said, the three books that I was analyzing today, and I mean, my choice was not random. I was looking at what is republished. Uh, yes, it is. And it is also the subject of animation and, which is most important thing, it is the subject of um, um, picture books. Uh, this is why, because sometimes you have to know ancient history just to understand the picture book, <laughs> you know, what those characters and those names mean. 
Um, plus, um, uh, the fifth grade is still the place where you learn Greek mythology and Roman mythology. So, uh, yes, uh, ancient history is a very important part of uh, uh, children's reading, but again, it's not incorporated into the required reading list for, let us say, um, history lesson in fifth grade. It is a recommended list mm -hmm. because those books, they sound contemporary, but at the same time, they have this flair mm -hmm. Soviet popularity with them. And this is this is tough. This is really tough because sometimes, you know, readers say, you know, this is the literature that was created during the Soviet time. We don't want this ideology. But it's this is why I think my interest in it is sort of um, sort of a small defense. You know, people were put into circumstances they, where they, if they wanted to write, they had to obey certain rules, regulations, certain metrics. But they were so honest in their knowledge of history and they were so honest in their desire to educate beyond and above the restrictions that they were producing wonderful, wonderful books that shouldn't be dismissed. Thank you. I think that we have time for one more question. Did the perception of uh, historical novels for children somehow shift or become less preferred by the target audience because of the Soviet space conquest? Was historical fiction used by children as a way to escape reality? Oh, it's a great question. Um, it was a great tradition of science fiction in Russia. I would say that the age group would move because for science fiction, you have um, the literature for young adults, probably more than children's literature. Um, you know, I don't know how to answer that. Um, For young adults and for um, for older, um, yeah, for young adults, that that was a niche in Soviet children's literature that was manifested by sci-fi, by by science fiction, and again, in science fiction, you also can find pretty much the same. Um, uh, meta texts, the same rules and regulations that were also for the historical novels. Uh, did children escape history to move toward the great future? Um, possibility of the great future. Some did, some didn't. You also have to think about um, uh, something else I have written somewhere else about it. So, but think about architecture that surrounded uh, Soviet children and is still surrounding post-Soviet children. Uh, if you go to the city of St. Petersburg, which is my hometown, so what do you see? You see cathedrals that look totally European. You don't have this onion uh, cupola. You see the building of Senat and Senat, you know, um, connected through the Triumph Arch. You see different monuments that absolutely take you back to ancient history, to classical antiquity. This is your surrounding. You have to understand the surrounding. And of course, if you go by it every day, every day, you know, you sort of get used to it. But at some point, you have a question. Why? The great emperor Peter the Great, his monument um, presents him presents him as um, uh, presents him as a Roman as a Roman warrior with laurels around his his head with toga as his dress. <laughs> so, and this is uh, 
I mean, those questions, they are questions, they are everyday questions. You cannot bypass them. Therefore, I believe that ancient history uh, will remain a um, field of interest for any generation of Russian readers. I don't know, I didn't answer the question that was asked about escaping. Uh, no, I don't think it was an escape. Um, and I don't know, I was never a fan of sci-fi and I am, I, I don't know how to answer a question, but I will think about it. Maybe I will come up with, Megan is here, Megan Swift. Can, can I answer her question? Megan, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Marina. And I, I have to apologize. I was teaching, so I came in at the at the end. I caught the very oh. last end of your talk. And I'm just connecting now to this last question. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, one of the preoccupations of Soviet writers, and I love the 1920s and 30s like you do, one of the preoccupations of those writers was how to deal with the past and really how, how to handle um, depictions of the past and how you're also dealing with the, what I dealt with the most in my book was how to deal with the classics of the 19th century. But you're talking about ancient texts. Mm -hmm. Would you make a differentiation between how those past, what, what was the relationship between Soviet writers and, and the past? Would you, would you say that there would you nuance the there had different relationships with different kinds of pasts mm -hmm. were, were some kinds of pasts less of a crisis relationship um less fraught um do you think that's important to to talk about the maybe the different kinds of um stages of the past uh, absolutely absolutely and thank you for your question absolutely the past was considered, first of all, we have to have domestic past and, and sort of the world history past, right? We have two different entities. And, uh, and uh, with the Soviet filter put on, um, put on Soviet writers by the government to begin with, but not only by the government, <clears throat> excuse me, by themselves, because I was talking a little bit about self-censorship, because, you know, I mean, we always forget, um, and I'm sorry, I mean, I'm just making a detour for two seconds. We are always, guys, we are always, when we talk about literature, we always forget uh, that those people, I mean, that was their mean of means of survival. I mean, they were writing and getting money for what they were writing. Otherwise, I mean, they didn't know anything else. I mean, that was their tool. That was their job. That was the money that they were getting for what they were publishing. So was, um, was their means of survival. So, and we always forget about this commercial part. So, and commercial part, not only commercial, but also, also recognition and popularity, but also publication. I mean, literature in the drawer of the desk, um, you know, this is definitely a very noble task, but, you know, not everyone can afford to do that. So, and therefore, uh, there were certain taboos in uh post-revolutionary historical narrative. And the domestic history was filtered very, very um, uh, strong. Like for example, what was allowed? Story of resistance. So for those of you students of Russian, Pugachev, for example, Stepan Razin, uh, Decemberist Revolt, uh, Chernyshevsky, uh, Gerson, all the figures that made it into the pantheon of um, post-revolutionary um, acceptance, they were all, if not required, by desired topics for the historical narrative. Uh, the uh, literature of the world, I mean, the history of the world, would also look through the same prism. What was fitted in, what was fitting in was very important. I mean, what was, uh, and again, what do we have there in the ancient world? We have Spartacus. In Germany, we have Thomas Munzer. In Italy, um, 
uh, would be in Italy. I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm thinking on my feet, you know, um, Giuseppe Garibaldi, for example, you know, I mean, those figures were the desired history. So the world history was organized as well as the massive history. They were organized around those accepted figures of the past. Plus, the idea was pretty much the same as a pre-revolutionary idea. We are learning from the best examples. We have our Plutarch. We have our collection of great individuals who, who we have to emulate. This is what we learn. And suddenly in the 60s, this is total reworking of this uh, phenomenon. So let us pay attention to everydayness. Let us pay attention to homo ordinarius. Let us pay attention to ordinary character because what we are interested in, we are not interested in individuals, in great individuals. We're interested in culture. We're interested in history, represented almost anthropology, if you want to. So, and of course, we have to filter that through uh, the restraints, through the political restraints, censorship restraints that every writer had to go through. Pretty much if you sit down, you have a list of topics that you can write about and a list of topics that you better don't write about. So, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. I think um, many of the questions that were coming from your audience today have to do with republications, how it's how Soviet literature is accepted today. And for me, that, these are all questions about how how we accept the how we accept pasts, how we read certain pasts. Mm -hmm. Right. It's always changing. Yeah. It is, it is, yeah. it is, it is changing. And even now it is changing, you know, depending on uh, how you interpret the political situation. I mean, think about Ukrainian history nowadays. Mm -hmm. So how do we interpret Ukrainian history through the Russian, through the Russian uh, lenses? So, I mean, mm -hmm. who is going to write about it? So, and mm -hmm. how do you write about it? I mean, you have to reconsider, I mean, in a way, I had to relearn certain things, you know. You have yeah. to reconsider all the connections. I mean, Mateusz is a specialist in Ukrainian literature, so you have to reconsider all the connections. So was Yaroslav the White did wise? Was he Ukrainian? Was he Russian? Who, who, who was he? Lithuanian. <laughs> yeah, Lithuanian. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is very complicated. And then the entire history, for example, of such a huge topic that was preoccupying so many Russian writers. I mean, uh, the history of the Tartar Mongol yoke, you know, 300 years of living next to each other. So what did we learn except curse words? How do you interpret it now when Kazakh history, Kyrgyz history is now more, and my Turkish history is more and more um, uh, known to us, accessible to us. I mean, wow, it's it, historical knowledge is a very, very different, difficult, difficult mm -hmm. subject. Yeah, history is changing. What is interesting in this combination of historia and geschichte, this is what was I trying to explain. Geschichte is changing. <sighs> So, this is what we want, but she is changing. So, historical events are changing. <laughs> That's good. That's very yeah. good. There's one more question, which is really good, and I, I really want to ask it uh, yeah. by Angelica Brown. Uh, you talked about major developments in Soviet children's literature. How different was the discourse in Soviet children's film and animation? Was it an area of more artistic yeah. freedom? Uh. It was no freedom. You know, we are always talking about, well, that was freer, that was this, that was that. No, it was a different aesthetics. You know, there were different laws, what was allowed, what was not allowed. And it was, um, it's so difficult to, it is so difficult to interpret it as freedom. You know, animation and film, uh, they are different media. You know, and um, you operate, you operate in a different realm of creativity, I would say. And that 
what we would consider freedom might be part of a normal, what is normal, discourse in this particular medium. Yeah. Um, however, uh, I mean, the history of censorship of animation is a very tragic, very tragic story. So, um, what is interesting to me with film, for example, um, and I'm not a film scholar and I'm not the animation scholar. So, um, and what was very interesting to me, that was the transition from text to film. And I look at film not from the aesthetics point of view, but I look at it from the point of view of a narrative, okay? So then you could see what would uh, be okay, permitted, allowed within the narrative, within the written narrative, but was not going to make it into the visual narrative. And one of those great examples would be exactly this, uh, I mentioned it several times, Arkady Gaidar's animation of his Maltishki Baltish and his sperm word. You know, when Gaidar is describing the tortures, but in film, of course, in animation, you don't see anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, how characters are presented. I mean, this uh, an angelic face of Malish, uh, of the young boy, you know, whom you see, um, and you understand that he's strong and why he's strong. He's a baby, Jesus. But at the same time, he's not a baby because he's a fighter. Yeah. Um, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to talk about, to compare what I am talking about with the visual narrative. I mean, that is you need different language. You need different vocabulary for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Justina has uh, has posted something very important in the okay. in, in the meeting chat, and I, I would like to read it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yusina's comment, which is perfect. Um, Yusina is saying that she loved uh, how you, um, how we were stressing how history is a story and employment of facts, dates, and how children's literature reflects this approach. Sharing this awareness is crucial in uh, sensitizing readers to official history propagated by the state at school. And this is so relevant nowadays in many places of the world. So thank you uh, for stressing how uh, how relevant this topic is now. So yeah, because we have a rewriting of history everywhere right yes. now, you know, not only mm -hmm. in this in the world that you and I represent. So but even in United States, where I live for the last 30 years, so over 30 years already. So, I mean, this is the process that goes uh, across the world and we have to be aware of it. We have to be aware of, you know, some okay. is very positive, some is not so positive, but, you know, maybe, maybe scholars after us will decide what what is good and what is bad, what is necessary. But I thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, my God. I mean, so many people stayed. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Justina and Matos, and thank you for your invitation. I am incredibly grateful. Um, I have a wonderful group of colleagues who work together with me on this project. So um, the subject of my presentation today is already an printed and I have to thank Olga Baronina for that so because she included this chapter in her big book so and um, but it has also the part on the Soviet historical novel so and I am happy if you have any questions yeah I am pretty good with email so please send me your questions I will be happy to answer them thank you thank you again and again and thank, thank you for you. you came thank you